Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker-puffed wheat and Quaker-puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one of your huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Say, if at breakfast time you're... Yes, hungry as a lion. Well, sir, just you dive into a heaping bowl full of delicious Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Man, oh man, there's a treat that'll tame that hungry as a lion appetite. Make it like a kitten. Yes, these ready-to-serve giant grains are shot from guns, are nourishing, crisp, tender, loaded with nut-like flavor. So tomorrow, enjoy this breakfast treat. Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Two men stood on the porch of the headquarters building of the Ace Gold Mine Company outside of Dawson City. The cold winds whipped about them as they listened to Frank Ames, company manager, who stood in the doorway. Mr. Wilson, you and Mr. Oakton are mighty lucky to own the Ace Gold Mine. The ore is paying plenty per ton, and it's showing a better gold content right along. Frank, his partners, Jim Oakton and myself, have seen some mighty lean days in the past. It wasn't just luck having the Ace Mine pay off. We put in plenty of hard work together, didn't we, Jim? We sure did, Ned, yes, sir. Others thought we were crazy to start mining operations out here. But our faith in this location and in each other's paid off plenty. I wouldn't mind owning some stock in it myself. Well, the Ace isn't a stock company, Frank. It's just a straight partnership, 50-50. And we got a written agreement that if one of us wants to sell out, he sells to the other. Yep. If something happens to one of us, his share goes to the surviving partner. Yep. That's in writing, too. <laughs> it shows how much we trust each other, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. But after all, we've been prospecting since we were practically youngsters together. First in California, then up here. It's hard to find friends that stick that close. That's right, it is. Don't either of you have any relatives? Uh-huh. I got a niece who married some fellow in Frisco and come to the Yukon. Never looked her up because I forgot her married name. I got no others. I understand they settled in Indian Creek near here. Yes, and I got only a no-good nephew took to gambling. He's working in the cafe right in Dawson City. Oh, uh, how's the new shaft coming on, Frank? Going to get it ready for working before winter sets you? Ah, it's pretty well started. Needs a lot of shoring before it'll be safe, though. Well, let's go take a look at it, Jim, and let Frank get inside to work, eh? Huh? All right. I'll see you later, Frank. All yeah. right, fine. Stop in before you go back into town. I, uh... I have some figures showing how much richer you both are since last week. <laughs> well, if it's better than we hoped for, we'll give you a bonus, Frank. Let's go, Jim. Inside the mining office, Frank Ames walked toward his desk. And as he sat down, he glanced out the window at the distant figures of Wilson and Oakton as they entered the unfinished new shaft. Then Frank spoke to a clerk who was working on books nearby. Ah, uh, Wilson and Oakton sure are a couple of fine men to have for bosses. That's right, Mr. Ames. They pay higher wages than anyone in the Yukon. <laughs> They've gone into the new shaft to look it over. <laughs> You'd think we hadn't struck gold yet the way they were so anxious to inspect it. They've already made their pile. Yeah, they sure have. What? Sounds like something's happened. Come on, Ed. <laughs> What's the matter? What's happened? What's happened? The new shaft. He caved in. What? Wilson and Oakton went in there. We didn't see him go in. Too late from now. Somebody get to town and bring a doctor. Quick. I'll go, Frank. I'll ride in and get Doc Baxter. The rest of you get picks and shovels. Hurry. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. We'll try to get a hole dug through by the time the doctor gets here. All right, come on, let's go. The men worked frantically. Fifteen or twenty minutes later, the hole was made large enough to bring the two victims out. The doctor was the first to crawl in, followed by Frank and a few of the men. Yeah, we can get him out now, Doc. We sent for a couple of stretchers from the Frank. office, and the men have him here. Wait, yeah, Frank. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Of course, we'll take them out. Yeah. But it's too late to do anything for them. What? They're both dead. News of the calamity was headlined in the Klondike Nugget, the Yukon's leading newspaper in Dawson City. And the fate of Ned Wilson and Jim Oakton was for a time the topic of conversation in every town along the Yukon Trail. A week later, Sergeant Preston and his dog King were at headquarters of the Northwest Mounted Police at Dawson City in the inspector's office when a young woman and a nine-year-old boy were brought in. This is a young woman who asked to see you, Inspector. Oh, uh, come right in, young lady. Well, I'll wait outside, Inspector, No, uh, you... don't go, Sergeant. How do you do, Inspector? I'm Mrs. Rockford. This is my son, Tim. How do you do? This is Sergeant Preston, Mrs. Rockford. How do you do? I've heard of Sergeant Preston. Golly, look at the big dog. Will he bite? Why, no, Timmy. King likes children, don't you, fellow? Uh, sit down, Mrs. Rockford. Uh, thank you. I just arrived in Dawson City, Inspector, on the last boat from Selkirk. I came right here since I didn't know who else to see about a certain matter. Perhaps if you'll explain a bit. If, uh, if it's something confidential, Mrs. Rockford. No, uh, no. Please sit down, Sergeant. Very well. I'm a widow, and my husband died of pneumonia last winter. I managed to earn a small living for Timmy and me by taking him sewing at Indian Creek. I see. Please go on. I heard of Ned Wilson's death. I understand he was quite well-to-do. He and his partner left a sizable fortune. Ned Wilson was my uncle. I was his only relative. I have letters, old ones, to prove that. Timmy and I need money badly, and, and I wanted to inquire what I should do about claiming what he left. My maiden name was Gloria Wilson. Hmm, I see. You wish to claim only the share that Mr. Wilson actually owned, is that it? Yes, of course. I didn't know Mr. Oakton, but anyway, I'd have no claim against his estate. What made you think I might have? Well, I think I can answer that, Mrs. Rockford. You see, a nephew of Oakton's, a gambler known here as Slick Dallas, has already put in a claim. His claim is for the entire estate what? left by both Wilson and Oakton. That's right. But I don't understand. How can he do that? The lawyer who represented Wilson and Oakton brought forth an agreement they'd signed between them which stated that if one died, the other was to get his estate. I see. But since they're both They were dead, killed at approximately the same time. But with his claim, Slick Dallas has presented a written statement by a Dr. Baxter that your uncle, Ned Wilson, died a couple of minutes before Oakton. You see, in that case, Oakton was, for those two minutes, the heir to Wilson's estate. Then with his death, his heir would inherit all of it. Oh, but that doesn't seem fair. It's just that doctor's word, and, and it's such a fine point. I know I... how you feel, Mrs. Rockford. Dr. Baxter has a sound reputation for integrity, and I assure you he detests Slick Dallas. Judge Ainsley here in Dawson is handling the matter. Well, I suppose there's nothing I can do. But as my uncle's only relative, I still feel his estate should come to me. I set my hopes on getting it, and... And we need it so badly. If if there does seem a chance that my claim would be considered, would you get in touch with me at Indian Creek? Of course, Mrs. Rothman. Mama, aren't we going to get any money after all? Aren't we? Hush, Timmy. We, we'd better leave now and go home. Well, don't give up hope yet, Mrs. Rothman. There might be some loophole. If you like, I'll take you to see Judge Ainsley now. You could at least put in a claim. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. It means so much to Timmy and me. I imagine We'll go to the judge's office right now, if it's all right with the inspector. Of course, Sergeant. Go right along. I'll be interested to know what decision Judge Ainsley makes in the case. So will I, sir. Come along, King. We're going with Timmy and his mother. <laughs> with Sergeant Preston's help, Gloria Rockford presented her claim to Judge Ainsley that afternoon. The judge called a hearing for the following day, notifying those concerned to be present. Being interested in what the decision would be, Sergeant Preston was among those present. Quiet down, everybody. Quiet down. Now, this is an unusual situation. Two people, each claiming to be the sole relatives, respectively, of Mr. Wilson and Mr. Oakton, have filed claims with proof of relationship to the deceased 
to the estates left by Wilson and Oakton. Frank Ames, you stated yesterday you heard Oakton say he had only one relative living? Yes, Judge. Mr. Oakton stated that he had only one relative, a nephew working in a cafe here in Dawson City. And what about Mr. Wilson? At the same time, sir, Mr. Wilson stated that he, too, had only one relative, a niece who had married and come to the U.P. Judge. I had to dispute the young woman's claim to being Wilson's niece and only right, 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 right. I know, I know, no, Mr. Dallas. I've read the, the wills of the deceased, and also the agreement made by them, saying that in case one of them died, the other was to inherit. I also have the paper signed by Dr. Baxter and witnessed by Mr. Davis, the attorney for the deceased, stating that Oakton died a few minutes after Wilson. Judge Ainsley. Well, Mr. Davis? In the face of the paper from Dr. Baxter, doesn't that mean Mr. Oakton, for those few minutes, inherited Wilson's estate and that Slick Dallas therefore gets it all? Mr. Davis, you being a lawyer, you ought to know it's not legal to decide this case on the strength of that paper alone. Dr. Baxter will have to appear in person. May I ask, Judge, why Dr. Baxter hasn't come here today? He was in town yesterday morning. I can answer that, Sergeant. As I told Judge Ainsley, the doctor left for 40 miles on the boat to operate on a close friend of his up there. I see. There's no telegraph office up there either. The winter's setting in, and Dr. Baxter would have to come back by dog sled. And no telling how soon. But, Judge, since the doctor may be delayed a long time... And, Mr. Davis, we'll have another hearing when the doctor can appear in person. And at that time, I'll set a date when this case will be tried. Hearing's over for today. We'll continue our story in just a moment. You know, the other morning at breakfast, I was just about to pour myself a heaping bowl full of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice when the strangest thing happened. I can't believe it yet. There was a terrible pounding on the door. I opened the door, and in walked a giant. Three, five, four, five. Uh, what do you want here? I'm looking for a rascal named Jack. Lives next to a beanstalk. Oh, uh, Jack and the beanstalk. But you, uh, you have the wrong address. Three, five, four, five. Oh, well, I'll settle right now for some food. What are you eating? Matter of fact, I was just trying to decide whether to eat Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Never tasted them myself. Oh, you'd really go for these ready-to-serve breakfast cereals. Why? They're so big, like yourself. They're giant size because the choice sun-ripened premium grains of wheat and rice are shot from guns. What? Yes, Quaker puffed wheat and rice are shot from guns, exploded up to eight times normal size. Why don't you try some? Well, pour out three or four packages for me. And you'll want some milk or cream and fruit. Sure, two or three quarts of each. With a giant appetite like yours, you can't beat Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Wait till you taste that delicious nut-like flavor and crisp, fresh goodness. Mmm, fee five, oh, yum. Mmm, they're good and good for you. Quaker puffed wheat and rice furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Well, come on, let's eat. Okay, but first, let me mention to the fellows and girls listening in that Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat are never sold in bags or bulk. To get the original crisp, fresh wheat of rice shot from guns, buy the big red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. That's your guarantee that you're getting the one and only delicious Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Shot from guns. Try them for breakfast tomorrow. Now to continue our story. After leaving the hearing, Sergeant Preston stood outside with King at his side, talking to Frank Ames. Ah, she sure is nice. Who, Frank? Uh, what, Mrs. Rockford. Oh, yes, she is. 
I'm going to Dr. Baxter's office for going that way. All right, Sergeant. Come on, gang. Since Doc went the 40 mile, why are you stopping in his office, Sergeant? Any reason? He has living room behind his yeah. office, as you probably know. I expect to find the place locked up, but I thought I'd look around anyway. Don't you believe he went like they said? Frank, it seems strange yeah. that Doc Baxter suddenly left Dawson and all his patients here to operate on someone at 40 mile when there's already a doctor up there. There's no telegraph at 40 miles, so I can't check, nor could anyone have sent him an emergency message. See, that's so. Usually, if he's going to be away from Dawson even for a day or two, Dr. Baxter notifies us at headquarters. This time, he didn't do so. And you think maybe that something is... Here's the doctor's is... office. The door's locked, and the front shades are drawn. Let's go around the back. in here, Frank. All right. Uh, looks like he left in a hurry, doesn't he? Yes, his cot's unmade and remnants of a meal are still on the table. That's not like the doc. He's always neat as a pin, Sergeant. Every time I've been in there, nothing was out of place. I wonder. Could be the... Look, Frank, they're on the floor near his cot. Uh, it looks like his medical kit. It is. Dr. Baxter wouldn't go on a case without that kit. That's right. What do you think he... Frank, I feel sure now that Doc Baxter didn't leave for 40 mile at all. Where do you think he is? Well, that's what I intend to find out. If I can get inside and get some article of clothing he wore, it'll give King his scent. And we can trail him. With the point of his hunting knife, Sergeant Preston forced the catch on one of the back windows and climbed inside the doctor's quarters. Soon he came out with a glove, which would serve to give the great dog King a scent to follow. I have one of his gloves, Frank. I'll get my horse and come back here, and then King can sniff this glove and take up the doctor's trail. And suppose he really did go on the boat. Then King will lead me to the boat landing. How about me going along with you, Sergeant? I'd like to see King in action. All right, Frank. Glad to have you. Get your horse and meet me here in 15 minutes. Right. After the hearing, Davis, the lawyer, crossed the street to his office. It was a short time later when Slick Dallas hurriedly entered. Look here, Slick. I told you not to come here to my office. Look, Davis. That money, Sergeant Preston, seems to be wise to something. Now, if he decides to go to 40 Mile to find the doctor... Now, take it easy, Slick. It's a long, tough trail to 40 Mile. He won't set out for there on horseback because there's every indication that a blizzard might hit before morning. And he'd have to wait a few days before he could set out with his dog team. I know that, but... My plan will work out all right. Tonight, we'll ride to the shack where we have Doc tied up. When Preston does set out after the storm lets up, he'll find Doc Baxter frozen along the trail with his horse near him. We'll make it look like he had to shoot the horse because it broke its leg. We'll arrange all that perfectly. They'll all think the Doc tried to make it back to Dawson on horseback during the storm. Yeah, all that might have worked, Davis. But now I'm worried. Well, I saw that Mountie and the mine manager, Frank Eames. They were snooping around the Doc's place just a few minutes ago. They were peeking in under the shades there. What of it? Well, I've heard about the way Preston's dog can trail people. Why, if he puts that dog on Doc's trail, you... Oh, snooping, Marty. Get your horse and meet me at the edge of town. We'll ride out to the shack right away and get Doc away from there. And if by chance that Mountie does come there, we'll see to it that he and the dog don't get back to Dawson. Let's go. A short time later, Slick and Davis met at the edge of town and rode at a fast pace up the trail. Shortly after, Frank rode to the back of the doctor's office where he found Sergeant Preston and King waiting. Ho, ho, ho! Sorry I took longer than I expected, sir. That's all right, Frank. Now I'll let King smell the doctor's glove. The trail's 24 hours or so cold. I hope King can pick it up. Here, fella. Find him, King. Find him, boy. The intelligent dog sniffed the glove and then moved to the steps of the back porch. For a few minutes, King hesitated. And then, moving from the porch, he turned toward Preston and indicated by barking that he had caught the doctor's scent. That's it, Frank. King's picked up the scent. Steady, fellow. Find him, King. Let's go, Frank. Come on. Come on, get him. An hour later, Davis and Slick arrived at the shack and entered. They stood over Dr. Baxter, who was tied hand and foot on a cot. Well, Doc, you must be hungry after being here tied up for 24 hours. <laughs> but we didn't come here to feed you. Davis, your scheme will be found out sooner or later. I usually notify the mounted police when I leave town, so they know where to find me. But I didn't this time. 
They'll get suspicious and investigate. Mm-hmm. One of them is suspicious. The judge wouldn't accept that paper we forced you to sign. He wants to have you appear in person. Good. Your trick didn't work. I'll tell the truth when I go before the judge. If you're dead, doctor, then there might be a legal way to get the judge to accept that paper. Dead? You can't get away with that. I've decided on a way. We'll spill oil from the lamp around first. And we'll rip open the mattresses from the two cots in here and pile up the straw they contain right near you. We'll set fire to the place, and uh, I feel certain if they do find you, nobody will recognize who you were. You must have known all along we couldn't let you live. Even if the judge had accepted the paper we forced you to sign. You'll hang for murder. They'll suspect something when I don't return. Yes, I suppose they will. But there's such a thing as needing proof, Doc, before the police can uh, arrest anyone for murder. You know, I was thinking, Davis, if that dog can trail like I've heard, and he trails Doc out here, why, maybe he'll be able to trail us after we leave here. I happen to know something about dogs, Slick. Before Preston's dog can trail anyone, the Mountie will have to give him a scent from something that person wore or handled. He can get something of the doctor's, but he has no way of giving the dog the scent of the ones who brought the doc here. Unless Preston knows for certain who did bring him here. I hope you're right. Davis, you're a disgrace to your profession. <laughs> Back in the States, my profession threw me out. Up here, no one ever asked any questions when I started practicing again. Get the lamp slick and fix things so the shack will make a good blaze. The less time we spend here, the better. Meantime, Sergeant Preston and Frank followed King as the great dog picked up Get the him. doctor's trail. Getting dark, Frank, and that wind means snow. Hope we don't have much farther to go. King seems sure of himself, but I hope we're not on a wild goose chase, Sergeant. King is sure of himself. He's turning off the trail now. King! Here, fella! Oh, 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 oh. Quiet, King. Look. Off there to the right. You can see the dim outline of a cabin. That's right, it is a cabin. That's where King was heading. Steady, Blackie. <laughs> we'll leave the horses here, Frank, and go to the cabin on foot. All right, easy boy. Someone right. may be with the doctor, and they'd hear us if we rode in there. Have your gun ready, Frank, just in case. Now let's go investigate that cabin. In the shack, Davis and Slick had made things ready and were preparing to carry out their plan. Though dusk was falling, it was still light enough inside for them to see clearly. Davis looked around and then spoke. In this wind, it won't take long for the shack to burn down, Slick. Wait, let me go. I'll ride toward Fort a mile, take a chance on the blizzard that's on the break. <laughs> you think we're fools, Doc. If you did get through, you'd talk. We're taking no chances. Oh, yes, you are. You think you know all about dogs, but you don't know that dog of Sergeant Preston's. He'll trail you. Wait and see. Remember what I said about proof, Doctor. I'll take this old newspaper from the table and roll it up. We'll get to the door, and then I'll light this and toss it back onto the floor. Let's go, Slick. No, wait, wait. Davis and Slick walked to the door. Then they stood a moment as Davis struck a match. There. Now I'll light this paper and toss it back in. All right. Here goes. There, it's lit. Now I'll... I'll take that. Wait, the grabbing the burning paper with one hand, Preston flung it over his shoulder into the open. At the same time, he sent a crashing blow at Davis. <laughs> oh! Got him, Slick! As Slick raised his gun to shoot, the great dog, King, sprang past his master and leaped at Slick, grabbing his gun arm and bearing him to the floor. Help! Get him off! I'll Help. fix you, Murray! Uh, 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 I'll this one on the floor, Sergeant. As Preston turned his head to speak to King, Davis reached for his gun. It won't take me oh, out. Don't... Acting instinctively, Sergeant Preston kicked forward with his foot, striking Davis's hand and knocking the gun flying to the floor. I'll take this. <laughs> Good work. They, they were going to fire the shot. Right. I'll untie you, Doctor. Thank heaven you got here. I'm as thankful as you are, Doctor. There. Uh, I guess you recognized them. Yes, Davis and Slick Dallas. They forced me to sign a paper, then brought me out here. That's smart, but not smart enough. I think we can persuade Judge Ainsley to reopen the Wilson Oakton case. After taking Davis and Slick, along with the doctor, back to town, the two crooks were charged with attempted murder and left at headquarters. Later, in the judge's office, Sergeant Preston told what had happened. Then the judge called upon Dr. Baxter. Now, doctor, tell us why those two men made you sign that paper. Well, Davis came to me and asked which had died first, Wilson or Oakton. I asked him why it made any difference. 
He said he had to know in case heirs on either side put in claims. I told him that Oakton died a few minutes before Wilson did. Oakton died first, you say? That's right. That night, Davis and Slick Dallas came to my place and forced me to sign the paper saying it was the other way around so that Slick could claim all the legacy. In that case, Oakton's share went to Wilson, and when he died, it was part of his estate. Oh, does that mean that, that I'll inherit my uncle's estate? Oh, golly, Mama. Will we get some money now? Will we? <laughs> Son, it means your mother will get plenty. What Oakton had and what her uncle had to boot. Gosh, Mrs. Rockford, that's wonderful. Only, I was hoping that if the case went against well, you, maybe Frank, we... Uh, under the circumstances, Mrs. Rockford will be your boss and she'll manage the mine she'll inherit. Mama uh. likes Mr. Ames a lot. <laughs> she told me so. <laughs> In that case, maybe someday they'll turn out to be partners, eh, Frank? Uh, gosh, Judge, I... <laughs> well... Uh... <laughs> King likes Mr. Ames, too, don't you, King? <laughs> Even King seems to be conspiring against us, Frank. I... I mean, Mr. Ames. Oh, gee, Gloria, I, I... And when you marry Mama, you can give me a dog like King, Mr. Ames. Timmy. <laughs> if that ever happens, Timmy, I'll give you a dog. But I'm afraid it'd be hard to find one like King. Right now, I'm sure King shares my feeling when I say I'm glad everything turned out well and that this case is closed. Hey, King? <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Say, when you watch hard riding, hard fighting Hollywood stars in action, remember this. One after another tells you to eat nourishing breakfasts of delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice topped with milk or cream and fruit. Wheat or rice shot from guns furnishes extra health values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Remember, it's never sold in bags or bulk. Buy Quaker Puff wheat and Quaker Puff rice tomorrow in the big red and blue Quaker package. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the Brothers Promise. Chick Colby was wanted for robbery and met his death trying to escape from the law. Just before he died, he entrusted a secret to his ten-year-old brother, and that secret nearly caused the youngster's death. When King led me to that clearing in the forest, Bull Lamont was leveling his rifle. From then on, it was a fight for our lives. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Remember, for delicious hot breakfast, enjoy Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereal is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereal is Quaker Oats. And here's why Quaker Oats is called the giant of the cereals. There's more growth, more endurance in oatmeal than any other whole grain cereal. So make your hot breakfast... Nourishing Quaker Oats. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pup Wheat and Quaker Pup Rice.